At WrestleMania 38, Stone Cold Steve Austin made his return to the ring almost 20 years after wrestling his last official match. Austin's performance was a joy and the Texas Rattlesnake got to end things on his own terms with a match that did his legacy no harm whatsoever. He is one of the lucky few because all too often wrestling comebacks disappoint, embarrass or otherwise go completely off the rails. You maniacs apparently loved the original so much so I hope you enjoy the sequel. Or should that be Scream Quill? <laughs> no, it shouldn't be. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 more wrestling comebacks that should have never happened. Join us. Number 10, Kevin Nash in 2011. After a disappointing quad tearing run in 2002 and 2003, Kevin Nash settled into life in TNA, where he worked for seven years before leaving in 2011. Big Sexy left his cozy surroundings in Dixieland after being contacted by WWE about appearing as a surprise entrant in the Royal Rumble. Nash, as Diesel, got a monster pop when he entered the match at number 32, and it was subsequently announced that he had signed a five year Legends contract with the organization. And that was all well and good. Before before WWE decided to interject their former world champion into the main event picture. Big Daddy Cool came back for a short run starting at SummerSlam where he cost CM Punk the WWE title. Logic dictated that Nash and Punk would soon collide on pay-per-view, but the storyline became a confusing mess and Kev ended up feuding with Triple H instead. That somehow led to the two of them competing in, of all things, a ladder match for possession of a sledgehammer. Sure, take the two guys who legally no longer have a quad between them and stick them in a situation where they repeatedly have to climb. Genius. Number 9. Test in 2006 Andrew Martin's initial WWE tenure was fine and all, but he never quite measured up to his potential before being released in 2004. That was fine too, because there was no doubt that he would be back before long. Call that first foray a test run, if you will. Anyway, the big man was brought back as part of the rebooted ECW in 2006 as WWE quickly betrayed the spirit of the original promotion and made it yet another muscle factory. Speaking of which, have you seen the friggin' size of this man? Clearly laughing in the face of the newly implemented wellness policy, the former Intercontinental Champion had a few decent outings against the likes of Rob Van Dam, but he was clearly not up to the task of being a headline heel, even on the lowly third brand. His shortcomings were badly exposed against against Bobby Lashley in their ECW title match at the Royal Rumble, and it was hardly a shock a few weeks later when it was reported that he had been suspended for his first wellness policy violation. A week after that, he was let go by the Fed. Number 8. The New Age Outlaws in 2013 Nostalgia in wrestling can be a great thing, and there was initial excitement when the New Age Outlaws began teaming up again in 2013. The D.O.Double-G and Mr. Ass hadn't been a regular team on WWE television for 13 years at that point, and as one of the most overacts of the Attitude Era, longtime fans had plenty of fond memories of them. It helped that they basically looked and wrestled the same way, but that was also part of the problem. The business had moved on, and though it was nice to hear the familiar catchphrases and see the trademark spots the first few times, the act got old rather quick. They primarily wrestled on house shows for a time, but WWE brought them back in a big way in early 2014, throwing them into the mix with The Shield, Kane and CM Punk, and then, incredibly, having them win the tag team titles from Cody Rhodes and Goldust. Billy and Dog continued to go over on the Rhodes brothers and the Usos in subpar matches before eventually dropping the titles to Jimmy and Jay. When they came back to put over the Ascension a year later, Later, the magic had well and truly gone. Number 7. Mr. Perfect in 2002 Kurt Hennig's return to WWE as an entrant in the 2002 Royal Rumble was, in a word, perfect. His appearance had been hyped up ahead of time and fans, having not seen him compete in a WWE ring since 1993, went wild when he came out at number 25. Kurt, wrestling as Mr. Perfect, put on a strong showing too, moving well and lasting until the final three. 
Sadly, though, it all went downhill from there. The truth was, he was nowhere near the dynamic performer he had once been, the consequence of a debilitating back injury and some ill-advised outside-the-ring habits. While it was initially felt that Perfect could be a major player once more, the bloom was soon off the rose, and he was from then on mainly used to put others over in short matches. From a hero's welcome to staring at the lights pretty much every night, Perfect slide down the card was sudden and stark. The comeback ended in infamy too after he was fired following his part in the notorious plane ride from hell. Number 6. Bret Hart in 2010 Bret Hart's career ended abruptly after long-term concussion issues suffered towards the tail end of WCW forced him to step away from the ring. That, coupled with a stroke he suffered in 2002, ended any hopes the hitman may have had for one final match or run, something that his lucrative Lloyds of London insurance policy would have prohibited. But the excellence of execution wanted the closure he never got for his career being taken away and for the events of the 1997 Survivor Series, so he came back for the unlikeliest of WWE returns in 2010. The prospect of seeing the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be working on his canvas once more was an appetizing one, but reality failed to meet even modest expectations. I am all for Brett getting some last moments in the spotlight and coming back to do the thing that he loved the most on the biggest stage, but everything from his WrestleMania grudge match with Mr. McMahon to his US title win and inclusion in the SummerSlam main event fell flatter than Vince McMahon on his backside backstage in Montreal. All. Number 5. Sable in 2003 Rina Mero got hired by WWE pretty much by accident, signed by the company after she accompanied then-husband Mark Mero to a meeting with higher-ups. Sable quickly became a phenomenon at the height of the Attitude Era, using her, um, assets to great effect as she became WWE's premier diva, landing her the women's title and a Playboy cover shoot in the process. At some point, however, the Meros got tired of it all and left the organization, with Sable subsequently filing a multi-million dollar lawsuit against Titan Sports. That was quickly settled, but it was assumed that the litigious Rena was persona non grata as far as Vince McMahon and company were concerned. How surprising then when she turned up out of the blue on SmackDown four years later. Though Sable still had value, this was not the same mega over bombshell that had driven horny teens the world over into a frenzy a few years before. The audience had changed and Sable's act didn't retain the same power. She feuded with Tori Corey Wilson became Vince McMahon's on-air squeeze and got another Playboy cover out of the year-long run, but there was really no reason for any of it to happen. Number 4. Alberto Del Rio in 2015 a lot can be said about Alberto Del Rio, most of it negative, but there's no doubting that he was pushed as a star during his first WWE run between 2010 and 2014. A former World Heavyweight Champion, ADR was fired after getting into a physical altercation with a backstage employee, but was brought back a year later. He peaked on his first night back, coming out as a surprise and beating John Cena to win the United States title at Hell in a Cell 2015. After that, however, he became more of a hanger-on as a member of the underwhelming League of Nations group and traded the US title back and forth with fellow luchador Kalisto. And from there, he was basically just another face in the crowd and received no sort of sustained push. It's fair to say his performances didn't exactly warrant any sort of main event role and he simply wasn't as over as he had been the first time around. After doing the honors for Cena on SmackDown, Del Rio, frustrated with his position and feeling as though he had been lied to by management, negotiated his release less than a year after his return. Number 3. Dusty Rhodes in 2003 for all intents and purposes, Dusty Rhodes' full-time in-ring career came to an end in WWE in 1990. The American Dream came back for the odd match here and there, however, for companies like New Japan, WCW, and ECW. Once the Monday Night Wars were over and Dusty was out of a job, he promoted his own turnbuckle championship wrestling shows and did the weekend warrior thing for the likes of Ring of Honor, MLW, and others. He also worked just shy of 20 matches for TNA between 2003 and 2004 
war. Often, those were simply a case of him lending his star power to brawling multi-man affairs, but he did have the occasional high-profile singles and tag bouts. That included an NWA world title match against a young AJ Styles and an NWA tag title outing teaming with James Storm to take on Kid Cash and Dallas. Rhodes was always one who used his charisma and showmanship to get over ahead of work rate, but there was something quite sad about watching the aging son of a plumber shuffle around and mutilate himself at half speed in front of the Nashville Fairground fans. Number 2. Trish Stratus in 2011 Trish Stratus received one of the best send-offs of anyone in WWE history when she decided to call it quits in 2006. At the Unforgiven pay-per-view, Trish beat her real-life best friend and greatest storyline rival Lita to win the Women's Championship in front of a rabid hometown Toronto crowd. Going out with her head held high, Trish's swan song was pretty much flawless. Given how popular she still is and how young she still was, there was of course every chance that she would be back for the occasional match here or there, like the time she teamed with John Cena's Bona to take on Glamorella. It's always nice to see the Hall of Famer show up, and she's usually good value, but her 2011 run through WrestleMania was a bit of a dud. The comeback segment with Kelly Kelly and Lay Cool at Elimination Chamber was sloppier than Sin Cara eating a chili dog, and then Trish was forced to play second fiddle to, of all people, Jersey Shore star Snooki. Making things worse, there was tension between Stratus and tag partner John Morrison, who gave the legend the cold shoulder because he felt that his girlfriend Melina deserved her spot instead. Number 1. The Ultimate Warrior in 2008 after his first controversial WWE departure, the Ultimate Warrior's career became a tale of massive headaches and diminishing returns for all involved. The former WWE Champion was, by most accounts, an expensive, temperamental nightmare to work with and typically left promotions under a cloud. It looked like his days in the squared circle were done following his catastrophic WCW stay in 1998, but incredibly, he returned a decade later for fledgling European promotion New Wrestling Evolution. NWE managed to coax Jim Helwig out of retirement for a match with Orlando Jordan of all people in the summer of 2008, with Warrior keen for his young daughters to see him wrestling in the flesh. Amazingly, they booked him and Orlando to go for 17 whole minutes in their NWE title match at Barcelona's sold-out Pavelo Olimpio. Even in his prime, Warrior's matches were more likely to go closer to 17 seconds than 17 minutes, so him putting in such a marathon shift as he approached 50 and after a 10-year layoff was not pretty. Fans filed out in their droves and mocked the rotten match with derogatory chants while it was in progress, with many neglecting to stay around and watch Warrior win what turned out to be his last ever match. 